David Harsfield's a radiologist and he's really extraordinarily functionally minded, particularly in vascular health and beyond. And, and regenerative medicine is a big play in what Dr. Harsfield does. And I'm delighted that he found me and that I've now found him. So without further ado, Dr. Harsfield, why don't you do an introduction and then get onto the whole topic of vascular health, which in my opinion is a huge part of overall health, particularly brain health as well. So, Dr. Harsfield. Uh, thank you, Dr. Carter and Dr. Lewis for having me on. Um, the next final frontier, there's always a new one, is inflammation, obviously, and then I'd like to talk a little about vascular health with the caveat that I spent most of my career working on 1% of the length of the vascular system. As an interventional radiologist, putting stents in things and whatnot, every named vessel represents about 1% of the length of the vascular system. 99% are capillaries, and that's where 100% of the physiology is going on in the body. So I was a plumber, basically, and now I've changed my ways. Um, I have no financial disclosures, no conflicts of interest. The concept now is that there's a correction of medicine that's ongoing. We were talking a moment ago about evidence-based medicine. I'm more interested in medicine-based evidence. We have too much data out there that means nothing as far as practitioners like us. So I'd like to get some semblance of connection between all the data points and what we're actually trying to do to practice medicine. So that'll involve a transformation of medicine. And we're gonna go from what drug, what surgery now to lifestyle change, and not a lot of folks are interested in that. They still want to smoke Marlboros and have a few drinks and uh, be a little overweight and have a magic stem cell injection to make their knee pain go away. Uh, but we all know how that works. Not telling you I know where things are going. Uh, sometimes the best way to predict the future is just to create it. The idea with inflammation, there is a regenerative type inflammation that is different from the degenerative type of inflammation. And that's what we need to talk about. Uh, when we're repairing tissues, the first two to four weeks are actually reg regenerative inflammation. That's a good thing. And then it goes on to, to remodeling and so forth and re restoration. Problem is we got background low grade uh, in degenerative inflammation and either toxins or unknown infections. Uh, two basic theories, the, the uh, uh, Louis Pasteur et al. had the germ theory, meaning that uh, germs basically were the cause of agents. And now we're starting to learn that there's a terrain component to this. In other words, if you take the metaphor that uh, human beings are a tree and they have a sick limb, I was taught in medical school, one of two things, either cut the limb off or throw some chemicals on the limb. And now we're learning that we need to understand what causes the problem with the limb and whatever the fix is, we're going to put that in the root system. Let's get to the root cause. Uh, infectious disease appears to be decreasing while chronic disease is increasing over the last decades. And as Dr. Lewis has pointed out, a lot of these infections and toxins are intracellular. They're not... Uh, observable with lab tests, the typical lab tests that we do. So they're still there and they're hiding out inside of the cells and creating this chronic low-grade background inflammation. Again, as we get older, we have a little harder time, uh, but what we're trying to do is to increase our health span more so than just our lifespan. Uh, a lot of cellular therapies, I'll talk about those in a moment. Uh, bottom right hand of this uh, slide here, that's where I spent most of my career, is trying to fix these blood vessels, the plumbing, where there's plaque, where there's clot, so forth and so on. And if we kind of work our way back around the smooth muscle, then we get to the organelles. Now we're talking about energy sources, electrons in the mitochondria. Then we look at the molecular information, the chemical uh, physiology that Dr. Lewis talks about. And then if you go into the atoms and a little beyond that, we're going to talk about a bioelectric field that probably directs all the traffic in our body. Uh, when I started out, uh, here's a catheter in the left renal artery, and we're injecting iodinated contrast material. Iodine is, uh, stops x-ray beams, so when you inject the contrast material and take an x-ray, you can see the 
renal left renal artery here's the adrenal artery and you can see segmental arteries arcuate arteries and then in a few seconds there's this blush and what I wanted to know is well, where the heck did that contrast material go in this little puff of smoke now in a few seconds it'll start to reformulate and, and form the left renal vein and go back to the heart so that little puff of smoke is the capillary bed so inflammation I've been looking at predominantly biomechanical in other words, macro level, large vessel issues. Uh, Dr. Lewis concentrates and Dr. Carter on the biochemical aspects of that in your physiologic chemistry. But then there's a bioelectric effect that we know about and we're starting to understand better. That I think is very intriguing. So again, top left, uh, people that say they're big boned, probably not. Uh, the biochemical component, and then of course the bioelectric field. Now, one of the things we've learned about our magical stem cell injections is they don't really go into a joint or an area and directly fix it. It's more of an indirect effect, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, the human body has a certain frequency and a vibrational frequency of its inner, inner energy fields, and when it's disharmonic, obviously that's disease. And the macro structure of the brain is not going to tell us the difference in a schizophrenic and a normal brain. They're going to both look the same on an MRI. So we're going to have to start looking on a microscopic level, which it's taken us three years to recreate one square, one cubic millimeter of brain tissue. So I don't think we're going to be able to look at structure as far as the brain's concerned to tell disease from non-disease. One of the other problems with the brain compared to the liver or the kidney, there's just so many cells that are in the liver and kidney, and we understand how they work. And when they're not well, then we understand those. The brain has so many different kinds of cells, and that they work, there's no real center of the brain. The centers move around and intercommunicate. So we're going to have to become aware of this bioelectric concept. Basically, the body resonates at about 78 megahertz. But disease begins when we drop our energy level to about 58 megahertz. One of the key things that we do not understand is how water provides the electricity that energizes uh, our bodies. The other thing that happens, we have a lot of electrical uh, centers, the brain, the heart, but also the fascia is a semiconductor. Electrons travel at the speed of light. Uh, through the fascia. So when we do surgery, we start cutting around the fascia, then we interrupt our electrical field. Now, as far as the water is concerned, H2O, when it gets in the body, it's no longer that, that composition. Again, a normal healthy frequency of the body vibrationally, 78 or so hertz, megahertz. And then here's the thing I'm most interested in now. There's a lot of fungal overgrowth that happens when we drop our energy levels. And it may be under the radar until we have an event, say COVID or an accident or traumatic life event. And then suddenly our body can't uh, deal with all the background low-grade inflammation. But there's a lot of mycotoxins that we can test for, as well as toxins uh, in our bodies that we need to fix before we try to do stem cell injections, say for a knee pain patient. Again, Nikola Tesla, pretty smart guy said, uh, if you want to understand the universe, think of energy, frequency, and vibration. You notice that you can't touch any of those things. Those are all non-physical. And he said, once you learn to study the non-physical, then you'll make a lot of, of headway. Here's some water in, in Japan. We have a colleague that, that worked on the crystallization of water. Uh, in the middle upper row here is nice, clean water from the mountains in Japan. And here's dirty water from out of Tokyo Harbor. So water is a resonator of the frequency and energy around it. Uh, the top right-hand crystallization was playing Mozart to, to a, a test tube of water. The bottom left was heavy metal music, kind of disrupts the crystallization. And the thought process, people holding water, thinking love and then thinking bad thoughts, actually changes the, the crystalline structure of water. Also, on the left-hand side, if you have um, sound at 432 hertz, uh, most of the music in Mozart's era, when you have the notes A played, 
plays at 432 hertz for the note A. And on the right hand side, for some reason in 1939, the Germans uh, changed this to 440 hertz. It really doesn't allow water to work as well as it could. Energy is voltage. Water is the basis of this structure. And the vascular system is a closed system where the red blood cells need to stay in there. Now, if you get a cut or some sort of an injury, you have bleeding. But basically, the cardiovascular system is closed as far as the red cell, the cellular component. But the uh, nutrients and the gases can diffuse in and out. Most of that happens at the level of capillary bed, and it's a very electrical phenomenon. If you think about your neighborhood kind of like a giant organism, there's all this electricity flowing into each of the houses, which are kind of the equivalent of a cell, if you think it that way, the metaphor, the walls uh, of the house or the walls of the cell, cytoskeleton holds it up, and then, of course, the connection. And blood vessels are basically our external electrical supply. The capillary beds are negatively charged on the surface. They have a thin lining called an endocalyx. We'll talk about that in a little bit. That's got to be healthy. And as Dr. Lewis points out, uh, cells have to live within two and a half to three cell widths away from a capillary to maintain health. So if you have a vascular problem, either through lack of vessels or through non-healthy capillaries, then you have basically the, the organ is starving. Uh, here's the cell itself, and these little structures here are the cytoskeleton. This is the, the part of the cell that, unlike our skeleton, internal skeleton, that's fairly rigid, the cytoskeleton moves the cell, it allows it to change shape, and when you put uh, hypertonic solutions in or when you're asleep, a lot of the fluid runs out of the cell while you're asleep to clean itself, and it allows these microtubules to then contract and change the shape. And a lot of the electricity runs, when the electricity is not in the capillary bed outside the cell, when it goes across the membrane into the cell, it runs along these little microtubules. Uh, five key things that can disrupt your voltage pattern. Number one, thyroid dysfunction. Uh, number two, parts. Because you think about a slice in your fascia, your semiconductor has got a block. Uh, dental infections are also basically a block in the six of, uh, or so of the bowel pathways that correspond to the acupuncture meridians and so forth, we've identified those, they run right through the teeth. So if you've got a chronic dental infection, then you've got a uh, block in your electrical field, you gotta correct that. Uh, emotional stress, we know about that. And then electron stealers, cells to be healthy have to be minus 25 millivolts internally, the charge should be that. And when they are charged negatively internally and they're healthy, the pH calibrates to about 7.4. When you start to lose electrons in the cell, which by the way, uh, infections like mycoplasma, viruses, and other microbes, but also toxins uh, and toxicants like glyphosate can steal electrons, then you start losing the electronegativity of the cell. And when it goes to, say, minus 20 millivolts, the pH drops to 7.2. And as you continue to lose electrons, the pH continues to get more and more acidic. And at about plus 30 millivolts intracellular uh, charge, that's when cancer uh, loves uh, to play. Um, now, we thought we knew that a crystal nature of water, it's solid liquid vapor when it's H2O, but when it goes into the body, because it's mixed with sulfates, basically it becomes jello. It's H3O2, and it also carries electrons. I'll show you in a second how that does, how that happens, Dr. Pollack. Beautiful research that showed this. Uh, so the circulatory system, we're approximately two-thirds water, but the problem is water is the smallest molecule. It makes up 99% of our molecules. Now, that works out really well when you're doing MRI because we're using hydrogen to make the images, so that really works great. Um, there are three different tissue types. The ectodermal is your skin lining. The endodermal lines the inside of the gut. And the rest is mesodermal or mesenchyme. So we're just a big blob of mesenchyme, and most of that's water in phase four. So we're jello, pretty much. So the cool thing is that water with sunlight acting on our skin turns the sulfides 
into sulfates. And sulfate loves to form cholesterol sulfate. It also likes to become SO4. Carries four oxygen molecules. So it's an oxygen uh, oxidizer, uh, is, along with the red blood cells that carry oxygen to the tissue. So sulfur, which is in garlic, uh, is very good for our health. Uh, why does the cell need to be negative? In 1801, there's a big argument about this. Totally wrong for all the reasons that a lot of our literature is totally wrong. Grossly bizarre, wrong descriptions in highly prestigious journals because they have ill-informed referees, over-trusting, equally ignorant editors, and then careless people just produce the scientific pollution. Probably 90% of the literature existing today in 10 years will be shown to be inaccurate or completely wrong. So that's why we have to research. I know that, don't quote papers from a long time ago. Let's research the things that we think that we know. Uh, actually, there's five phases of water. I'll get into the quantum phases. Um, now, if you take bulk water, here's a lining, a gel uh, surface. It's much like the surface of a cell, and then it's hydrophilic. Here's the graphic that shows that. When water becomes H3O2, and it's a gel form formation, it will actually become negatively charged along the edge of this hydrophilic substance, and in doing so, it pushes any particulates away to produce an, a positive charge here. It's a great way. You add uh, light to this particular infrared light, look at how much exclusion of these particles you get. So when you go out in the sunlight, and your blood uh, it takes the uh, uh, sunlight through the skin and into the venous blood that's on the surface, you're actually cleansing. This is called exclusionary zone. It's excluding all the particles. They're using this theory to clean water. It's a really great way to do it. Uh, here is the graphic of when you're having infrared go into this gelatinous easy water, exclusionary zone water. Look how much greater the volume is and how much you can push particles away. Uh, a student walked by one of the experiments and shone, shined a light on that. And wherever there's this light, it increased the exclusionary zone. That's when it occurred to Dr. Pollock. We need to get in the sunlight and get more infrared light. Now, when you do that, this exclusionary zone has got a negative charge. And what do we say about the intracellular environment? It needs to be negative, okay? So this is how the inside of the cell is minus 25 millivolts when it's healthy. And then on the surface, there's all these protons, but guess what it does? It creates a current, bioelectricity. And basically, we kind of are like plants with two legs and a brain, or at least some of us have a brain. Um, the plants take water uh, uh, and produce hydrogen and OH, and then we take in the infrared. Unfortunately, we have to eat a lot of our energy. We need vitamin C, vitamin D for some reason. Uh, we, we don't make that, and so we have to consume that. But the other thing we need to do is to get in the sunlight, walk around barefooted on the ground, you get electrons, Earth's negatively charged as well, and those electrons line those 60,000 miles of capillaries. That's your uh, biggest ground in the human body, your healthy, negatively charged capillary surface. So inside of the cells, all this negatively charged water creates an electrical field. Uh, it's a little bit busy, I'm gonna skip this one, but basically it talks about this structure of water that surrounds all of our cells it allows protons, a positively charged uh, acid molecules, to come into these endosomes, which you need inside the cell because you got to digest all the trash and whatnot. So you have to have an acidic lysosome. Basically, inside the cell, you want it to be 7.4, 7.5, nice and alkaline. And then the mitochondria needs a little bit of a gradient. It's an acidic between the inner and outer uh, membranes uh, to create, to generate that electricity. And again, those protons go right along the cytoskeleton. Remember, we talked about that. Now, the reason the cytoskeleton is important, it's made up of tau and amyloid proteins. That ring a bell? Because when the cytoskeleton breaks down and you start depositing these amyloid beta proteins, they make clumps. It's like a brain stone, just like a kidney stone. And later on down the road, you're going to start to deposit tau fibrils. And it messes up the way that cells work, and that's Alzheimer's. But here's the point. Alzheimer's is gonna be due to an infection or a toxin. And these tau and microtubules are breaking down because they're part of the immune's response to this invader, whether it be microbiome, toxin, or toxicant. 
And again, here's Mr. Sulfate. And when he gets in the sunlight, it induces a charge separation. And then he's, he lines the cell membrane and here this soil oxygen molecules that he carries with him. So sulfur is really good. Now, if you really look at the, the, the last uh, mechanical motion that goes on in a human being, uh, there, there is obviously an electrical component to this, but proteins need to be folded properly so that they work well. So when the DNA is transcribed into messenger RNA, and then that goes into the endoplasmic reticulum, they start creating with the amino acids these proteins, and then they go in the Golgi apparatus and make these little exosomes that then can be released. You have a really good protein, whether it's an insulin receptor, whatever. But they have to be folded properly. And if you have poor electricity in the cell, they aren't folded properly. Or if you have a poor gut mechanism, a lot of bacteria in your gut misfolds the protein that you eat. It doesn't get folded properly, and it's sticky. And we notice that 90% of people that have Parkinson's are missing their appendix. Not sure what that means, but I bet that means that those little bacteria that were living there helped to fold these proteins so they weren't sticky and they didn't swim to the substantia nigra and create trouble. So biomechanical, we know about the protein restructuring and so forth, but it's a bioelectrical phenomenon. Again, red cells are charged negatively on the surface, and so are the inside linings of the capillaries. If you've ever played uh, air hockey, uh, the red cells should not touch the inside, physically touch the inside of the capillary if they're healthy. And when they get not so healthy, that's when you start having contact and shearing and so forth. And also the arterial end of this is negatively charged in the venous end of a capillary acidic and positive, so that electrostatic force, change in voltage, pulls the red blood cells through. 100% of the human physiology occurs in the capillaries, like we talked about. And red cells are like sponges. Uh, at the arterial end, the arterial bed's about two-thirds the size of a red blood cell, so it has to squeeze it. And by squeezing through the arterial of the capillary, it excretes its fluid and intracellular molecules delivers nutrients at the arterial side of the capillary. Then as it goes to the venous side, it starts to enlarge like a sponge. It sucks up and imbibes the fluid and removes the waste. It's beautiful. Uh, again, now going from right to left, the red cells going through the capillary, and you can see the capillaries negatively charged, these yellow minuses, and then the outside of the red blood cell uh, uh, plasma membranes negatively charged. When you have uh, a charged particle moving, it creates an electromagnetic field. And this electromagnetism from its biochemical composition creates a bioelectric field. And guess what it stimulates? Mr. Sulfur down here. And also what happens? Nitric oxide. That's the key to health right there. Nitric oxide is what vasodilates uh, arterials uh, and allows increase in flow and there's a little synth a little enzyme here that gets stimulated to make nitric oxide. And when you're the lining of your capillary bit sick, you don't make nitric oxide and your body starts to starve. Again, here's the red cell flowing through. We can see that now kind of take from the uh, endothelial cells, this little blue dude here, and then this is the gelatinous glycocalyx. And it's got these little frond-like things and it is uh, a, a lot of interesting things to live there. One of the things that does live there is heparin sulfate. And that's why uh, some viral infections, such as the COVID, create a hyperimmune response. And so indirectly, our body's capillaries start to melt away this endocalyx, and we lose our heparin sulfate supply. So when the blood slows down and it comes to almost complete stop in the capillaries, that's when we get these microthrombi that people talk about. Again, cholesterol sulfate supplies oxygen, sulfur, cholesterol, energy, and negative charge to all the tissues. And so cholesterol is a good molecule. We have to quit thinking in terms of cholesterol being a bad actor. Again, sulfate comes when uh, sulfide in the skin is struck by a light. And the endothelial nitric oxide synthase, the little enzyme, creates nitric oxide. So basically, our skin is a solar power battery. Dr. Stephanie uh, Seneff uh, is a really 
brilliant teacher, and she has described mechanisms whereby deficiencies in cholesterol and sulfate are some of the most important factors behind these chronic diseases. We cannot get energy to the cells because of that. Now, here's one of the things we're seeing. Roundup herbicide is about to get blasted. Monsanto, and I think Bayer owns them. He's, this glyphosate molecule is a bad actor. It, it looks like glycine, like an amino acid. It's taken up and it messes up a lot of the ways that our body works, particularly the nitric oxide production along the endothelium. Again, uh, Dave Harshfield has spent half his life on the name vessels, <laughs> and 99% of the length of the vascular system is capillaries. Now, we come by a lot of this ignorance, uh, honestly, because uh, Galen described in the second century AD, the circulatory system he thought was two different systems. He said he felt like the heart pumped one side and sucked on the other side. So the heart was basically a sucking organ. It wasn't until the 1600s when William Harvey correctly described the my macro circulation. So he figured it out. It was all one system. But that was the macro, and no one really described the micro circulation until uh, in the, the 1970s, and now Dr. Hans Vink is, a, is an expert. By the way, we have a uh, conference coming up this Friday you guys need to take a look at. Um, the, oh, the circulatory system, the two major circuits, here's the upper extremity arterial and venous system. So the extremity arterial system, you got the pulmonary arterial system, you got the gut, and you got the kidneys. Those are really the four most important. So essential for uh, all physiology, uh, now, as the aorta on the left, blood swelling here about 70 centimeters a second, it divides into the iliac arteries, into the femorals, into the deep and superficial and so forth. And here's the velocity of the blood in the aorta, it's moving really fast. Each time the aorta divides, it increases the surface area. The cross-sectional area increases every time the, an artery divides. So that by the time you get the blood cell gets to the middle of the capillary bed here, it's barely moving. Look how low the velocity is. And then it starts to speed up as it goes and forms the veins and goes back to the heart. Again, there's my little arterial seat. And I just wanted to know what that poof was. And here I am. Finally, it took me 20 years to figure it out. So uh, tag red cells, we measure. Uh, they go through each of the four systems in about 11 to 19 seconds each. So that means in about a minute, your total blood flow goes through all four circuits. Pretty amazing. Now we understand the importance of the closed system with regards to the red cells. Remember, the red cells are not supposed to leave uh, barring an injury or some sort of leakage. Now, where are these darn stem cells? Well, it turns out each of our bodies have got pericytes, peri meaning around, and they're around the capillaries. Perfect. That's where everything's going on. So these little guys are hanging out here, monitoring what goes on. If there's an injury, toxin, whatever, they jump off this capillary and become whatever they need to be. Again, here's the artery, here's the capillaries, and here's where Mr. Pericyte lives, the stem cells, the potential uh, healer for our bodies when they need reproduction. Sometimes we're not well enough, the pericytes aren't healthy enough, or our body's sick, and we have to do, we have to in, introduce uh, stem cells into the, an area to heal that, and I'll talk to you in a minute about our studies for people that were going to have leg amputations and how we could save their legs. Again, just showing at the arterial system, the cross-sectional area is pretty narrow, and look at the, the, as it divides into the capillaries, that's the widest cross-sectional area and the slowest moving blood. That's when a clotting happens there, particularly when the glycocalyx is sick and you don't have any clotting factors, heparin sulfate. So again, blood never leaves the network, but oxygen and nutrients can diffuse along into the interstitial space before it gets to the cell. And we're gonna talk about how the interstitial space is really important. We have to maintain health of that, as well as the intracellular fluid. The extracellular fluid is about a third of our water. The intracellular fluid is about two thirds. And then the lymphatic system is open and it drains all the big, large molecules that are leaking out at the arterial capillary venous uh, intersection, and these all go back to the heart and are dumped into the circulation. 
Here's a stat for you. In the United States, 1.7 million people live without a limb. It's estimated one of every 200 people in the U.S. has had an amputation. Now think about that a second. And if you don't believe it, next time you go to Walmart, start watching Mamma and Papa. That's not his leg. That is not his leg. We have got to stop this amputation. The reason it's happened is you've got a bunch of doctors that don't understand we can save these legs. And plus, they get paid to do the amputation. And they do it in multiple steps. They do, when the toe gets bad, they'll do a transmetatarsal, and they'll do above the ankle, then they'll do below the knee, none of those heal without our help. And then finally, above the knee generally heals. So there's four nice surgical procedures that have a CPT code and a revenue stream. We can stop that. Uh, di problem is differential diagnosis. When you have claudication, it's like um, you get up and walk around and your legs start to feel heavy and achy. It's because you ran out of oxygen because the vasculature can't bring the blood down into the capillary bed in your lower extremity. Problem is, it's really easy to confuse vascular claudication with claudication from nerve compression. Uh, lumbar disc disease and so forth, or just knee and hip pain can make your legs feel tired. Um, when you have obstruction at the iliac, here's the A right here, obstruction here can present with buttock or hip or thigh pain. So these people come to me often and go, Dr. Archer, I've got a left hip, I want you to inject with some stem cells, I think I have arthritis, and I go, no you don't, you have a vascular problem, let's fix that first. And then if you have blockage here down the superficial femoral or deep femoral arteries, you might have thigh or calf pain. And if it's down around the level of the knee, obviously you could have knee, calf, and ankle. You can misinterpret vascular problems. And that's what we're trying to do, train these doctors that are doing stem cell injections. Don't forget to look for the vascular system. Uh, it's real easy to do. You put blood pressure cuffs along the path. On the left leg, look at the normal pulsatile waveforms, iliacs, femorals trifurcation, foot, toe, toe pressure. Look how normal the left is. Uh-oh, look, look at the right. So with a blood pressure cuff, you can identify this gentleman and say, hey, we got to get on this. Uh, rather than just going, oh, you got a wound that's not healing, let's cut your foot off. We've got to start working these people up. Now, inflammation, regeneration, as we said, have a close relationship. But regeneration can only take place when degenerative inflammation is controlled. And that's why we can't just inject stem cells into people. We have to look at their lab work, look at their endocrine system, get that tuned up. We call it prehab. Do our little magical injections and then do our rehab. And when you inject a, a biologic into someone, the rehab is totally different than it was before uh, when you inject steroids or whatever. Now, a colleague of mine, Augusto Brazzini, is also an interventional radiologist. He's in Lima, Peru. And he taught me how to do this. And it's really interesting. It was endovascular implant, meaning they infuse stem cells into the artery. Now, we tried to do this in the heart for heart attack patients, but when you inject it, stem cells in the artery, they didn't get to the capillaries. Makes sense, doesn't it? Because they're too big. Now, if we went into the jugular vein backward, into the coronary vein, and you inject it backward, guess what? It would go through the venous system retrograde. These stem cells would get into the tissues. So Dr. Brzezini said, hey, um, uh, most of these people that we did in our trial, I'll talk about that in a second, had minor tissue loss, beginning to have ulceration gangrene, Rutherford fives and sixes. So bone marrow stem cells, they take it as spray from your bone marrow, will produce angiogenesis and vasculogenesis. Angiogenesis means there's a vessel there, but it's not open, so it'll regrow itself with some mature uh, endothelial cells. Vasculogenesis means there's no vessel anywhere, but it'll start to grow with little stem cells and create little capillary beds on its own without having to regrow its, its um, maternal uh, feeder, the arterial system. Uh, here's another thing. When we inject stem cells into someone, imagine these pink cells are the stem cells we injected, and the blue cells are the patient cells. Well, it turns out, like we talked about, stem cells don't fix anything. They're like the refreshment card on the golf course. They bring the Gatorade and the hot dogs. Your stem cells, your little golfers have got to stumble over to the card, get them a Gatorade and a hot dog, and then go back out and start fixing whatever it was that they were having trouble with. And these little nanotubes we discovered were one way that these cells talk to each other 
in another way is that uh, these stem cells release these little blebs are called exosomes, extracellular vesicles. They contain really healthy messenger RNA, and they also contain some micro RNA that helps to reduce that bad inflammation. So these exosomes come out and swim over to these patients' stem cells, and they incorporate them. And they'll make better proteins because the messenger RNA from a healthy stem cell is going to make better protein than the sick messenger RNA from a sick cell. And then also this microRNA, very short 22 to 24 nucleotide length uh, RNA factor, turns off a lot of unnecessary inflammation in these cells. So they have energy now to, to heal and not to degenerate. Again, angiogenesis, you got a normal vessel. Uh, you inject stem cells around it, starts to increase uh, growth of these uh, endothelial cells, and you grow a new, new vessel from an existing vessel. Vascular genesis, you just don't have anything. A lot of times we'll inject in the feet of people who have no flow, measurable flow, and then we'll create little capillary beds. It's really cool. And again, here's those little secretory factors, probably exosomes. All cells release exosomes. Exosomes are in every body fluid, sweat, eyes, tears, everything. And it's the way cells talk to each other when they're right, not right next door or they're not within uh, the length it would take to put that soda straw in the, in the cell, three cell cells away. These exosomes are the way that they talk to each other. Here's one of the patients. They have gangrene in the tips of their first and fourth toes. Uh, here's the bone marrow. Aspirate the bone marrow out, spin it down. Here's the plasma. Here's the little stem cells in here. Here's the red cells. We don't need those. So you put a tourniquet around the patient. You inject into the vein. It goes backwards into the tissues through the capillary bed. And then also Dr. Brazzini went anagrade and injected into the arterial system. Not sure how well that worked, but he did both intra-arterial injection and retrograde venous injection. Guess what? This, uh, stop, this uh, gangrene was arrested and the patient ended up having lubricants in her toes. But check this out. She came in, in a bit unable to walk with necrosis at the tips of the toes. Necrosis remained, but was limited. They had to amputate the toes. And within 11 months after injection, the patient completely, totally recovered, started walking without difficulties. So we can use autologous stem cells. We can take the patient's own stem cells, in this case out of their bone marrow, and inject them into these ischemic legs and safely and effectively prevent them from having to have an uh, amputation. And I'm almost done, uh, Dr. Lewis. I'll go through my study protocol, and then I'll be through. Uh, this was a critical ischemia trial that came out of uh, Tufts University, and it was for patients that had no option critical ischemia. And I'll talk in a second about what that means. Again, the retro classifications, when you're normal, you're zero. When you're going to get an amputation, you're six. They wouldn't let us uh, treat ischemic rest pain patients. They just wanted us to do these patients right before they got amputation, they thought, although none of our patients got amputations. So that was pretty cool. Um, the placebo uh, for the trial, we, we did aspiration of the bone marrow and captured the stem cells of the bone marrow. And we didn't do intraarterial or intravenous. We went under ultrasound and put a few drops of these stem cells along the neurovascular bundles in the lower leg through the skin. And I'll show you how we did that. The placebo was taking some of the patient's own blood and injecting that. Well, guess what? The autologous blood, the patient's own blood, worked almost as good as the stem cells. And that's why we didn't lose any legs. So... What we were, the primary outcome for critical ischemia is you want an amputation-free survival. And we got that in spades. We didn't lose anyone. Now, the reason that insurance companies are not paying for that is they say the patient doesn't live much longer. Well, let's go back to what we talked about in the second slide of this, this talk. This is not about uh, lifespan. This is about health span. Even if these folks don't live any longer than they would have, they won't, have an, they won't have spent 10 years of their life, the end of their life, with an amputation and sick and with all these wounds that don't heal. So it's not about lifespan. It's about health span. This definitely improves that. 
Secondary goals, obviously, to relieve pain, close up these wounds. We call it uh, having a hole in your spacesuit. Cannot be weeping fluid out of your skin. You got to close that up. And you got to, 50% of these people that get an amputation are dead in the first year. And I'm telling you, it's not because of the amputation. They just turn loose of the rope. It's very demoralizing to lose an extremity. The things that we tried to do back in my career, remember I talked to you the first 50% uh, of my career, I spent uh, doing balloon angioplasty and stents, covered stents, and cryoplasty, freezing the stent, atherectomies, and the surgeons doing bypass. Nothing stays open below the knee. So you can stent the aorta, the iliac, the femoral, and the popliteal arteries. But below the knee, none of this stuff works. And so that when we work with the cardiologist, they stent above the knee, and we do our procedure to increase outflow below, the wound heals, the patient does great. And two silos come together, cardiology. Uh, the problem is that these people don't have a blood vessel. You do an arteriogram, here's the popliteal vein, boom, gone. Now, where would you even do a stent down here? So what we do is we go in on an ultrasound. We can see where the blocked off artery is. And we just inject some stem cells right next to it. Again, we know where they are. Here's a little patient that had a skip graft that clotted off. They always do. Nothing below the knee stays open with our typical stents in surgery. So let the surgeons and the cardiologists put stents in these vessels to the knee and then let us do the injection. Now, what's going on in the capillary bed? low oxygen and it's acidotic and it hurts like all get out and the substance p is the pain generator and the hypoxia and acidosis is, is what really makes the patient sick um, normally if you have a little skin you know say you have a wound burn the skin here but you, you're normal you know arterial inflow then you release these stromal cell derived factors uh, from ischemia from the burn like I, I saw a kid with a burn just like this from a motorcycle uh, muffler burn and you release that SDF1, it goes to your bone marrow. Guess what? Your bone marrow sends, sends stem cells back. Voila, heals the wound. Uh, in our design, uh, we drew blood. Uh, here's the placebo. And then the patients that two out of three got the treatment. We aspirated the bone marrow, spun it down, and we injected the bone marrow aspirate concentrate. They both looked the same. The cardiologist injected. They didn't know what they were injecting, nor did the patient. I did because I was running the study. And we injected along the vasculature through the skin, not through the artery or the vein. Again, it took 15 minutes in the OR. And even if you can't find a vessel, you know that the dorsalis pedis is here. Just about every inch, put a few drops of stem cells along there and along the inner aspect of the foot and ankles where the posterior tibial would have been. Uh, here are the little dots we marked off. We could see where the vessel was, so we go in and inject the stuff. We inject it. You just pull the skin back, plunge the needle in, put the stem cells. Now, don't inject it into the artery because that's a neurovascular bundle. It's got an artery, a vein, excuse me, an artery, two veins, and a nerve. Guess what? We didn't grow back arteries, although the arteries grew back. Guess what we did? We restored the nerve. <laughs> I was just a plumber. I thought we were we grew an arteries until it dawned on me. The patients would say, uh, Dr. Arshville, I can feel my foot. And I go, what are you talking about? I could not tell if I had a shoe on before you did this injection. And I went, wow. So we start using this for peripheral neuropathy treatment. It, it treats the neurovascular bundle and Mr. Lip channel, the whole thing, the whole electrical pathway is in this little structure. If you put a few drops about every inch or so of these stem cell biologics, you can improve that person's lower extremity, arterial inflow, sensation, and venous outflow. And this gentleman had transmetatarsal amputation, but we injected right at these little markers. He did not lose any more tissue. So cells as therapeutics, they work next door to each other, autocrine, uh, paracrine across the pathway, endocrine you can send these exosomes and information to distal cells. Um, by the way, under the wound, if the wound is circled in red, we would stick a needle under there and inject in a radial fashion, inject stem cells, the wound would heal, would close the wound. 
no risk. That's the beauty of this. No serious adverse events. And these were sick people. And when you treat the cardio, the circulatory system, guess what? You're treating the nervous system. They get up and walk. Their muscular system gets better. Skeletal, everything. All 12 systems are treated, even though you're really thinking you're regrowing arteries. Now, I'm kind of at a point here. I'm not going to talk about the endocardics because I don't have much time. I want to ask, I have to spend some time to have questions. Dr. Uh, Lewis, if you want to, we'll just stop here. That's perfect, David. And, and um, okay. Yeah, I'm not sure how many questions we ha we have, but it was just so brilliant. I can tell you this: you can't go any further because it was overwhelmingly rich with information. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to ask you to uh, help me write a blog or two on this topic for people to understand. But if anybody has any questions, feel free. And um, you know, while we're we're waiting for questions, Dr. Carter, any comment on shockwave and how it relates to what? Uh, Dr. Harshfield is doing here and vice versa. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So the benefits of the shockwave therapy <clears throat> um, definitely track with what you, you know, put into practice here, Dr. Harshfield. So, you know, increasing your own endogenous stem cells um, with the shockwave device. And um, as a matter of fact, our device does have uh, FDA clearance for healing diabetic foot ulcers. Um, they recently got uh, clearance for treating um, burns. And of course, uh, the FDA clearance for, you know, uh, treating musculoskeletal pain. But a lot of the off-label uses of it, you know, are quite varied and so forth. But, um, but yeah, this was an awesome talk. Yeah. Amazing. Beautiful. My question, Dr. Harshfield, you mentioned, you know, garlic and, uh, you know, you mentioned prehab. What, what are you able to do in your practice with prehab? I know you're sending some folks our way. Yeah, before we do any sort of biologic on a person, uh, Thomas, we're going to have you evaluate them because we've spent a lot of our time teaching doctors how to guide needles. You can see this is very technical. It's really fun for a doctor to do stuff like this. Problem is, no matter how accurate you are, let's say a cruciate ligament tear in the knee, under fluoro, put the needle here, stem cells go right in the ACL sheath, all oh, perfect. Well, guess what? You just inject it into a sewer, if you take the metaphor. That stream, if you'd have gone to the mouth of the stream and made sure the endocrine system was clear, thyroid especially, also, down a little further, immune system, the gut's got to be healthy. Because if you don't fix those two things, the physiologic health, Dr. Lewis, as you know, then no matter how good you are putting this needle in this ACL, the patient's not going to heal. And it really is teaching us that we're doing a lot of uh, mycotoxin screens and so forth. Uh, a lot of our patients, personal injury in particular, have got whiplash injuries and they tear their ligaments in their neck and so forth. But they also have a traumatic brain injury. And what we're learning is that patients with TBI, traumatic brain injury, why would some of them get thumped in the head and go right along and recover no problem, and others get thumped in the head and they, they have problems? They have a background, some sort of microbe, toxin, toxicant, that is low-grade inflammation in their brain. And so they, in essence, are like the COVID long haulers, is that they had a pre-existing issue and they are not going to get over their TBI the same way. So when you evaluate those folks, you go, Ms. Smith, <laughs> your thyroid's not looking good or, or, you know, this is what we've got to do. It's going to take some time. You're so good at explaining to them this is not going to happen in a day. It's going to be log linear. It's going to take a few months. It, but they all want to do this, Thomas, because they trust us. And it makes as much sense as anything they've heard. Um, and uh, some of them are desperate. They've tried everything else. So uh, your physiologic health, by the time people get to me, they're sick. I mean, heck, anybody can tell this guy's leg's not well. He's got a wound. He can't walk. Right. Well, you can diagnose them 20 years ago if we just could. Right. And that's, what we're, that's our goal. Can you, um, can you get off share, the share screen for a second? Oh, okay. I'm going to throw something up. But we, we wrote about this in 2011. Um, I think you're still there, but anyway, the, the title of the paper is The Inflammatory Blockade Restores Adult Hippocampal Neurogenesis. 
And basically, it's, it's saying when you have inflammation, your stem cells aren't working. And I think you articulated that extraordinarily well through the, through the talk. So, um, you know, very impressive. The pictures of the water, all, all that stuff was just amazing. Um, what, what we don't even understand water. I can just say it. <laughs> What do you do for self? Obviously, there's a, a sulfur deficiency in the United States. What do you do for sulfur than garlic? And Dr. Carter, you can chime in too on this one. I'm using some um, um, garlic. Uh, it's uh, deodorized. Maybe that's not the word. Uh, it's not bad at all. And I've gotten uh, this prescription from uh, Natalia Bragg. Is a naturopath that lives in Maine, and she has these four key elements, selenium, B12, high-dose vitamin D, and th these garlic pills, and it's awesome, and you take, you know, four or five of those a day, and you don't get the garlicky stuff that, that you get, um, and that works great. Right. Whenever I'm around the feds, I try to eat as much garlic as possible. <laughs> um, no, but the, the other thing that we, MSM, Michael? Yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Egg yolks contain a lot of sulfur. Uh, if you if you are like me, that you actually sweeten things now and again. I haven't used it in a long time, though. Molasses. Molasses contain a fair amount of sulfur. Blackstrap mm -hmm. molasses. So, yeah, I think that there's a good take-home lesson here that, you know, there's, there's, there's a, a void in... Um, in sulfur in our bodies, and it plays a major role. Dr. Senoff has been talking about cholesterol sulfate as being a building block. You know, cholesterol is a building block, but something has to make the cholesterol reactive. And it's this, apparently the sulfate version that allows it to react to lead to the steroid hormones and cortisol and all the other molecules that, um, that are derived from cholesterol, vitamin D. Um, let's see. So, uh, Judy has two MD children. She's going to have you have them watch this. Dr. Harshfield, she was then impressed. Um, Steve says, be careful with eggs with prostate issues. Well, let's solve the prostate issues, then you can eat your eggs. <laughs> um, are you aware of that connection, Michael? The, uh... No, I, I was not. No. Okay. Steve, send us something on that. Um... I'll, I'll read this. Um, my leg was hot and hard to touch, then it turned purple and now black, but for some reason my hairs on my legs begin to grow again. My legs are stiff and inflamed. Dr. Harshfield, tell me what you do with this kind of a scenario. Uh, I have to see the patient, uh, do some real non-invasive testing, those uh, ankle brachial, measure the pressure in the ankle compared to your arm. It should be a ratio of about one uh, when it's like 0 0.9, 0 0.8, certainly 0.5, you've got a vascular problem. And then you do segmental pressures of below knee, above knee, and so forth. You can figure out where the blockage is, and then we've got to fix that. And you need to talk to your cardiologist because I learned the hard way. When you start fixing people's lower extremities, so they had a blood clot in their anterior tibial artery below the knee, we go in, put some urokinase in, dissolve it. The patient can now walk without pain. Well, heck, I didn't think about it until I thought about it. His leg pain, he'd mow the front yard. His legs would ache. He'd sit down, smoke a cigarette, and get up and mow the backyard. Well, now he'd mow the front of the backyard and had a heart attack. So when you have vascular issues in your legs, you got coronaries, it's because it's just like your house. It's, er it's everywhere. It's in every room get with a cardiologist, get your heart ready to get well, and then see how many, how far down they can stent. If it's a block, I'm just assuming. Uh, and then below that, it's just so simple, I can send you a video of how to do it. Uh, one thing we don't want to miss, though, venolymphatic outflow. That is, I can get flow to the foot. My trouble is having the lymphatic and venous flow return most of it's muscular when you take steps and your calves squeeze the venous flow back out of the extremity. A lot of that is physiologic. Thomas, as you know, the lymph in extracellular space, you've got to address metabolic issues to get that fluid out of there. 
Right. Do you do, do you do over the phone consults for folks that have these have a problem like this? Sure. Okay, good. Excellent. And um, if we write a, oh, let's see, I got all kinds of things changing here. We'll have to write a blog on this, and um, you know, I'm happy to share your um, contact information. But there's the one: inflammatory blockade restores adult hippocampal neurogenesis. The major problem with with um, brain diseases, any stem cell work done in the brain. I mean, I know Dr. Carter probably knows this, but I'm not paying much attention to that area. Yeah, and it probably ought to be another talk, Thomas. I do a lot of that. You know, we work, we've work. we been working with NASA in the past, the NFL, and there's a lot of cell therapy we're doing. We're, we're doing a TBI trial coming up here. It's going to be inhalation of exosomes. Remember we were talking about that? Yep. So, yeah, that's a whole other talk, probably. Anytime, anytime. I think, um, I think it was extremely well received. I really appreciate it you coming on and doing this. And you'll be available 8 o'clock Eastern time tomorrow night? Absolutely. I think a lot of people are going to need to listen to it again because there was so much rich information there. I will send you a PDF of these slides so that you can give them to everybody. And literally, they will give themselves, they're like reading a book. I know that's a lot, but I don't write textbooks anymore because they keep it behind a paywall. I don't think that's right. When you're teaching, you shouldn't charge people for this. Uh, I'll send you the slides so folks can go through them at their own speed. And then the um, Boston BioLife talk that we were both on that being that's being broadcast on Friday. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What? Um, send me a link. For, send me a link for that so I can put it out there so people can listen to that. I think that's okay. going to be a very good conference as well. And we're I think we're going to be live at the end for the um, panel session. Q and A. Lovely. Okay. Okay. Lovely. Thank you very much, uh, everybody. Yeah. We'll see you again. Privilege is mine. Thank you. Thank you. It was great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I appreciate that, everybody. Thanks so much. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you.